Mitch Russo returns for another segment, this time as the CEO founder of Power Tribes which finds hidden assets in companies turning them into superstars, making consistent recurring revenue with no product upgrade, new releases, and not dependent on anything else to generate revenue. And this is all done by building fanatically loyal clients. Mitch tells us how to create a high volume revenue stream for our company next on Revenue Chat. Hi everyone, this is Tony D'Arso with Revenue Chat. With us we have Mitch Russo once again. He was last with us talking about his number one bestseller, The Invisible Organization, How Ingenious CEOs Are Creating Thriving Virtual Companies, which is the CEO's guide to transitioning a traditional brick and mortar company into a fully virtual organization. It became an instant bestseller on Amazon across several categories. He co-founded Time Slips Corp., which grew to become the largest time-tracking software in the world before it was sold in 1998. Then, Mitch went on to join longtime friend Chet Holmes as president, later to join forces with Tony Robbins, and together created Business Breakthroughs International, with nearly 300 people and about $25 million in annual sales. Mitch says, make it happen, and he's doing that. He founded Power Tribes, which focuses on a hidden asset of companies and turns that into a powerful recurring revenue stream without any new upgrades or product launches by the company. His websites are MitchRusso.com, that's R-U-S-S-O, and PowerTribes.net. All right, get ready for Mitch to help us find the hidden assets in our companies that can create recurring revenue streams. Let's bring them on. Hello, Mitch. How are you? I'm great, Tony. How are you? Hey, I'm very pleased to have you back on our show again for another go. And I thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with us on Revenue Chat. My pleasure. Oh, it's great. And I see you've been through quite a bit of success since the last time with your number one best-selling book, The Invisible Organization. (laughs) That's correct. It sure is. Good, good, good. Now, (laughs) Mitch, before we go into the show... I wanted to let you know one thing. I just interviewed Dove Barron a few days ago. Oh, he's awesome. Yep. Well, he had some amazing words for you near the end of our show when he heard you were coming back on. Yep. And you can listen to it, but he called you a wise man with great insights, and he strongly advised all listeners and the audience to pay attention to what you say, and he said you're going to have some great nuggets for him. And uh, I also wanted to mention he was on fire, and he gave a very good interview as well. Oh, good. Yeah, I really like Dove. He's he's a uh, he's a guy who has a expertise that is very rare. He is able to basically encapsulate ideas and convey them and communicate them in a way I think that's so powerful and so beautiful. And and this is his ability to teach this to others is incredible. So true. So true. So with all that said, so this is my caution to the audience that's listening now. Okay, everyone, listen up very carefully to what Mitch says. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mitch, just earlier, I mentioned a little bit about you, and perhaps you'd like to fill us in a little more on your roots and how you became an expert in your field. Okay. Mitch, Mitch how did it all start for you? Well, you know, in the last interview, I told you a little bit about how it started in my rock band when I was a kid. Um, and um, I love to tell that story, and I'm not going to tell it again. You'll have to go back and get the last interview from Tony to hear that. But but here's what it comes down to. I, I, since I've been a little boy, I've been an entrepreneur. And I find that commerce and business is the, one of the most exciting ways to stay interested, to, to be productive, and to help myself and others around me with the services that I've, that I've come to offer. So I started probably shoveling snow as a little boy and washing cars later in life, you know, as a, as a young man. Um, and then I went on to have a rock band, and we had a lot of success with our rock band, maybe more more than other 16-year-olds do. And and uh, we were able to play uh, the Democratic National Convention, uh, one of their parties, and uh, back in New York City many, many years ago. And it was a lot of fun. Then I went on to to go to work as an electrical engineer and eventually as a marketing engineer until finally what probably was my very first and most you know real experience on my own with my own business was in real estate. I, I started buying properties in Boston 
And I ended up with uh, about 12 or 13 units, not a lot. Um, and at that point, uh, I found I didn't enjoy it. So by the time um, I discovered that I had this incredible desire to build a technology company, uh, I was ready to sell my buildings and fund my new company uh, with the money from my, my real estate holdings. And that was the beginning of Time Slips Corporation. And some, something amazing about starting a company in your garage, I had no backers. We had no investors. It was just my partner and I. And I came up with an idea. I showed it to my partner. And he was my neighbor, actually. And he became my partner. And once he saw the idea, I think it ignited in him the same feelings that it did in me, which is, oh, my goodness, this could be big and we could do this. And it was that feeling of we can do this that drove us to continue to work on this nights and weekends for months until eventually we got to the point where we said we can leave our jobs and do this full time because that's how confident we are that we can make this happen. And we did. And we were very, very lucky. We were able to be cash flow positive uh, in the first 30 days. Uh, but to be fair, um, we were running very, very lean. So, you know, even if we only sold five or $600 of software a week, for us, that was enough money to cover our expenses because we worked out of our homes. And uh, we had both had enough savings to cover our living expenses for several years. So it was having that freedom, knowing that we had a very little, uh, we didn't need a lot of money to run this new company. And our our day-to-day survival was not dependent on selling one more $99 software program. So that made life more comfortable for us. And it also allowed us to take the time to do to do it right. That's the way I think about it. And that's what we did. So we built time slips from the ground up into basically a hundred employee company that we later sold to Sage in the UK for eight figures. And um, along the way, we learned a lot of interesting lessons. One of the lessons that I learned back then, and again, I'm talking about the years probably 1985 through 1994. And it was in 1994 that the sale took place and I transitioned the company to Sage over the course of four years. But right before that happened, in about 1991, I ran across a problem and I wasn't quite sure how to solve it. And I was a young entrepreneur. I was a new entrepreneur, uh, but I was inventive. And so I used my creativity to try and figure this out. So here was the problem I had, Tony. And this is why I felt at the time it was an inspired solution. So we had been growing sales in our channel. We sold software through, through retailers, through mail order, through catalogs. There was no internet back then. And what ended up happening is that sales accelerated, but even faster than sales, our support burden started to accelerate too. And what that means is that we would sell a software program for $99 and it would come with 30 days of free support. But we were selling so much that the 30 days was overwhelming us. And we had a, a call center with 40 people, 40 plus people in there called tech support. And still we had hold times of, of 12 to 30 minutes at times. And that was completely unacceptable to me. Then it came to a head when we started to get uh, calls because now the user base is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we started to get calls from people who said, you know what, I want someone to come to my office and help me with this software. So I have this reputation of taking care of my clients. I always have, I always will. And back then, I even personally spoke to the first 10,000 or so of my real clients individually. And when I mean I spoke to them, it means I sold them software or I answered questions about it, or I supported it directly because in those early years, you know, the founders do everything and that's some of the stuff we did. So I get a call from one of my original customers and she's upset. And she says, look, I am having a problem here and I got to have somebody in my office and it needs to be now. And I didn't know what to do. Now she was very influential because our software controlled law firms and helped them create bills for their clients. And you don't want to mess with attorneys and their money, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so I had to figure out a solution. And so I didn't know what to do. And I'm thinking, my goodness, I could fly somebody out there, but you know, that's a big hassle and I probably couldn't do it for a week. 
So I, I remembered a conversation I had with another one of my clients who happened to live in the same city. And her name was Ann. And I called up Ann and I said, Ann, I, I got to ask you a favor. And she says, is this, is this Mitch? I said, yeah. She goes, oh, Mitch, it's great to hear your voice. And you know, she was so happy to hear from me. So it made me feel like it was going to be a little easier to ask her for a favor. <laughs> so I said, Ann, I got to ask you a favor. Would you mind going over to a local law firm near you and seeing if you could help them with your time slips insulation? And she said, oh, Mitch, for you, of course I would. Thank you so much. I said to her, I really appreciate it. And, and I sat there for four hours wondering what was going on. I gave her the address. She goes over. And about four hours later, uh, she calls me on the phone. And uh, she says, oh, don't worry. Everything's taken care of. It's all straightened out. I said, oh, Anne, thank you so much. I'm so happy. And she said, and you're not going to believe what happened. I said, what's that? She said, the client turned around and handed me a $100 bill. And I thought to myself, oh, my goodness. And she said, and by the way, Mitch, if there's anybody else you know who needs help, you just let them know that I'm available. And boom, this idea popped into my head. If Anne could do this, and she's certainly not you know, trained, she's just someone who happens to be good with our software, what would happen if we created a training program that would allow people to learn our software at a much deeper level and then get referrals from our company to go out and consult on our products. And that was the birth of the Time Slips Certified Consultant Program. And so, you know, the funny thing about this program is that it started very simply. We created a test, and it was kind of hard. Um, and we sent an offer to sell the test to people in our user base. And we sent out, you know, probably uh, back then everything was in the mail. So he's probably sent out about 10 or 15% of our user base, probably our older user base, because we knew they'd be more experienced. And we say, look, we're creating an opportunity for you to take a, a comprehensive test to see if you would qualify for potentially being certified in our software. And we had hoped for 10 or 20 people to respond. And we were overwhelmed. We, we must have received over 100 responses with checks to buy this test for certification. And so we sent out the tests and people sent them back. And about 80% of the people failed the test, which was great because we really wanted the best of the best. And those 20%, we gave them a certificate and called them certified. And then we started to send clients to them. And that's when the problem started. In fact, we went for almost six months sending um, some of these people who we called certified to our clients and found out later that it was a disaster. And it got to the point where we were threatened by one of our clients uh, because the person who showed up was so incompetent that they actually couldn't believe it. And so I shut the program down. And I decided that even though I was running a company and that was growing very quickly, I was going to get on the phone and call every single client who had a problem with one of my certified consultants and understand what that problem was. And I did. And I sat there day after day. I dedicated a couple of hours a day and I just made these calls and I, I recorded the conversations and I made notes. And what I discovered was that I had made a huge mistake and I almost crashed my company doing it. And so I took all of the information I learned and I, I spent the next four to six months revamping the program from the ground up and I built a brand new higher end certified consultant program with a higher level of training and a higher level of qualifications with background checks, with all of the things that I should have done to begin with. And I relaunched the program into my user base and I'll skip to the end and just tell you what the result was. The result was that two years later, we had certified 350 people and each of those people had paid us uh, a lot of money, let's put it that way, thousands of dollars to be certified and then to stay certified. And then they paid us again to get more training. And then they paid us again to, to attend our symposiums. And then they paid us again and again and again for lead programs and for sales training and for all the things that we offered them. Before you know it, Tony, we were two years out and we found, again, to our surprise, because this was not by design, that we had created our third largest sales channel ever. 
Now, remember, these were our clients. These were the people who we had already sold our software to and were using it every day in their own office. And they later, because of their interest in wanting to be an independent business owner on the side, we ended up creating professions for these people. And so when later it came time for me to sell the company, the value of my company had doubled in those two years. And a big piece of why was because of this incredible network of certified consultants that we brought to the table. And literally in two years, we had generated so much buzz around our company. I mean, we were the only software company besides Intuit to have nationwide offices all over the country and another six or eight countries besides. So it was all because of this group of people who paid us year after year after year to stay certified that we were able to make this happen. So there was no overhead. I had one person running this whole program. It wasn't like I was paying a sales force and yet they were our third largest sales channel. It wasn't like I had expenses to bring them all in and, and educate them. They paid us to attend our symposiums and our education and talk about loyal and talk about loving people. See, what I didn't realize at the time is that I was also creating a community at the same time. And this community began to grow and grow. And this community showed up for us. They showed up at our trade shows. They showed up at our PC user group meetings. They showed up even at our client sites to support the company. They showed up everywhere. And it was such a beautiful feeling to know. It was almost like a family. And this family was such a beautiful extended family that for many, many years, even after I sold the company, I stayed close to this group of people. And amazingly, it wasn't maybe three months ago that I received a note from one of the first certified consultants on, on LinkedIn telling me that they're still certified in time slips and how it changed their life by becoming certified. So this was a beautiful uh, segment of my life. It was an incredible experience to have done this. And, and to tell you the truth, I almost forgot about it. And what I mean forgot about it is that, you know, the experience itself was incredible and I loved doing it, but I moved on. You know, after I sold my company, I then started a venture firm and then I ended up working directly with a venture company and grew them into the largest furniture shopping site on the internet. And then later I had this chance to work with a buddy of mine, a very close friend. His name is Chet Holmes. And Chet brought me into his company, Chet Holmes International. And I started at the bottom. I started recruiting salespeople for him and then built his recruiting division. And he invited me to become the president. And then later we brought Tony Robbins in and we started negotiating with Tony. And we, we put together a deal over the course of about six months to actually do a live event called the Ultimate Business Mastery Summit in which Tony and Chet and about 15 other superstars would show up on stage and speak to approximately 500 people. And this was going to be the launch of Business Breakthroughs International. And Business Breakthroughs International was one of the most exciting things I ever did. We were able to take that little company that I joined Chet in, and we were able to grow it 100% a year, three years in a row. We had nearly uh, 30 million, over 25 million in sales at one point. And the company was going gangbusters. And I got to work with Tony Robbins on a regular basis. Uh, Tony and I would work together on programs. We would talk about, uh, you know, really what our objectives were. And he would coach me. And I mean, I couldn't have had a better business coach than Tony Robbins. And I loved my job. And I loved what we were doing. And I, I felt like we were changing the world. And then, unfortunately, at that point, Chet got sick. And uh, Chet... Uh, didn't know at the time, but he had come down with stage four leukemia and it was, and Chet was a fighter. He had this thing he called pig headed discipline and, uh, and he stuck with it and he fought and he fought But 60 months later. Unfortunately, he passed away and I lost my best friend. Uh, I lost an incredible opportunity. Uh, and at that point I was, I was so, I, I, I was so at the end of my, my rope on this, I just decided that I needed to go. And I, and I left BBI at that point. Um, and I left the best way I could. Um, I left with, with, with a lot of friends and a lot of people that I had helped and a lot of people that, that called me their mentor. And I love that. 
Uh, and then I didn't know what I was going to do with myself. So I started another company and I began writing a book and that became The Invisible Organization. But something interesting happened about a year ago. And I want to tell you about it. Please, absolutely. And I must say that is an amazing list of successes you've had back to back. Just really, truly astounding. Well, thank you, Tony. There's, there was a lot of things I tried in between, like many entrepreneurs that didn't work. And I didn't tell you about those, but, but they're, they're part of everybody's, every entrepreneur's uh, background is littered with mistakes and, and, uh, and, and things that didn't work. And mine's no different. But I wanted to tell you about this one thing that, that was sort of a life changer for me. I happen to love helping people. And I put myself in the place and a position to help as many people as I can. I enter my, you know, I join networks of people and I speak up. And when people need help, I show up and I do stuff because I love to do it. And then if later they become a client, that's fine. But the most important thing is I get such a kick out of helping people. So I offered my help to a, a, a young man. And I say young, he's probably in his 30s. And he has an incredible company called Link Selling. And his name is Josh Turner. And I was helping him basically craft and perfect his webinar strategy. Because we had run a lot of webinars uh, at, at uh, BBI, Business Breakthroughs. So I'm on the phone with him and he happens to have read one of my blog posts about this story I told you earlier about having built this certification program and mobilizing this network of 350 people. And he asked me some questions about it. And I talked more and more about it until finally he said to me, do you think you could do that for us? And I thought about it for a minute. I said, well, why not? I mean, it's like riding a bike. I mean, all of those lessons that I learned are the same exact lessons that I could apply today. And all the mistakes I made, I would certainly make sure that we would never make all those mistakes. And believe me, I made plenty. So he contracted with me to build the Linked Selling Certified Consultant Program. And he was very excited about it. I was very excited about it too. And we, we rolled up our sleeves and we got to work. And let me tell you, these guys were amazing to work with. They're smart, productive people. And they listened. They were coachable. And the bottom line is we were able to put this program together in a little less than three months. And Tony, we launched this program into their user base and it was an immediate success. I don't mean like it was kind of successful. I mean, I'm talking... Seven days into the launch, we had generated over 150000 just in certification fees alone. And I made them shut it down at about 20 people. And the reason I did is because I told them that this is a pilot program. And we don't want a lot of people in the pilot because we're going to make mistakes when a brand new program is created. And our job in the pilot is to over-deliver to the people who did sign up and fix all of the mistakes that we had made along the way so that we don't make them again. And he agreed, and we did shut the program down to a lot of disappointed people. A lot of people came for money in hand wanting to join the program, and we turned them away, and we said, we'll, we'll, we'll reopen the program next time after the pilot is done. And I've been working with them ever since, as I do with all my clients, to make sure that they continue to be successful. And so they've been working with their pilot clients to the point that we have literally graduated. Almost 100% of that pilot class has now been successful as a certified linked selling consultant. They love what they're doing. We gave them a profession. We brought them a community of people that they can interact with and learn from. So this is what I have evolved to do now because I felt like this is really what I think can be the best way I can make the biggest impact on the most number of people. And since then, the, uh, the founder and CEO, Josh Turner, was very kind to record a, a testimonial video, and that's on my website as well. But, but what it's come down to is clients have come to me and asked me to build programs for them. And I love to do that. I love the process because to me, business is, is basically, I want to say it's a game, but it's more like a puzzle. And what I love to do about working with clients is I like to apply my, my creativity and my experience to figuring out the puzzle of how to optimize and maximize revenue for every one of my clients. So that's what I do now. I, and I call this business Power Tribes. And the reason I call it Power Tribes, Tony, is because, you see, what we're building 
is we're building a tribe of people, a tribe of people who become family to the owners and to the employees of the company that's running the tribe. And the reason it's called a tribe is because it's not a one-way street. It becomes a community. It becomes an interaction between people. It becomes a sharing experience where everybody helps each other, where we don't really think of each other as competitors, quite the opposite. We help each other as collaborators, and we're all trying to accomplish the same thing. We're all trying to take the tools that our company gives us, and we share them with our clients, and we we help each other earn a great living doing it. And to me, this has become the most satisfying thing I've ever done for people, and now I'm doing it for companies uh, all over the country, and I love it. That is quite awesome, Mitch, and I definitely want to ask you a little bit more about Power Tribes. I believe I understand the concept. This is quite quite a company. I guess, is it part of Power Tribes? Because you say that even successful business owners live in a constant state of fear. So why is that? And do you have a solution for that? Well, let's talk about why they do first, and then I'll explain how we can fix that. So I was a business owner, and I am a business owner now, but I owned a big business. I mean, not 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 IBM big, but I I owned a $10 million business and I ran, you know, a business with a hundred million dollar valuation and I've run, you know, Tony Robbins company as well. So I've run some businesses and I'll tell you what all CEOs are always concerned about. You know, every day is a new day. Every month is a new month. And when I say live in a constant state of fear, it's not panic. It's just anticipation. Where is next month's revenue going to come from and how can we do better next month than we did this month? So that's part of what I talk about in my materials about living in this state of fear. And the reason I bring this up is because by building a power tribe, what you end up doing is creating multiple new recurring revenue streams that help alleviate that fear because recurring revenue is like one of the eight miracles of modern business. You know, it's sort of like compound interest. (laughs) Recurring revenue is something that is a beautiful thing if you can get it to work right and it's self-perpetuating. And so what I try to do with my clients is I help them create multiple recurring revenue streams using a Power Tribe certification system to do so. So now once that system is in place, people aren't afraid anymore. People don't worry about where the majority of their revenue is going to come from month after month because once their power tribe is established, we know that we have a floor every month for people recertifying and showing up for sales events and doing all the things that are exciting and interesting to everybody in our community. So that's what I mean. I got you. Very interesting. All right. Now, and I understand that state of fear, and I understand that having worked in the corporate world long enough, especially in sales, it's You're only as good as your next sale. It's like you're always, where's the next one? Where's the next one? You have to keep on it. So I understand that constant anxiety, if you will. Now, as part of that, you've worked with a lot of companies on the inside, as you say, and you talk about two types, the strugglers and the superstars. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Sure. Well, you know, there are people who I call superstars. And the reason I call them superstars is because they're constantly learning. They're constantly open to new ideas. They're constantly trying things to bring their success to the next level. And once they see how something works, their mind automatically goes into creativity mode and they start building on it and they start evolving it. And those are the superstars in business. Those are the superstar CEOs who are really able to to, I would say, I use the word grok it, they get it, and they just integrate it. And all of a sudden now, it becomes part of them, and it becomes part of their nature to take that new idea, that new technique, and just take it to the next level. And those are the people I love to work with. And those people, by the way, have one very interesting characteristic. And it's a characteristic that I call, that the strugglers don't have. The superstars are coachable. And what that means is that superstars seem to seek out the advice of people who know something they don't and they trust that it's right. And then they follow that advice and they get the benefits of having had that advice. And whether it's a book, a coach, a consultant, 
or, or a mentor, nothing feels better to one of those folks to see somebody benefit from their knowledge. And superstars are those people. Unfortunately, the strugglers are the ones who resist the type of coaching I'm talking about. The strugglers listen and then do it their way. The strugglers don't seem to stick with things long enough to really get a result and then immediately declare that the idea was bad or the process was broken. See, to me, when you separate people into those two categories, I know which one I want to work with. I want to work with the superstars because those are the folks who can appreciate what I do. Those are the folks that come back to me and record testimonial videos and make me feel good and reinforce my value in this world. So that's what I meant. I got gotcha. you. Very cool. And I'm totally with you on that. The superstars, well, they want to succeed and they keep at it no matter what. And I don't think that they're embarrassed at all to ask for help. They know they don't know everything. At least that's the way. And I think that's what keeps them on the forefront is they always want to improve their game. Exactly. Exactly. All right. That's so true. Thank you. All right. Mitch, what is the hidden asset that every business has? Well, you know, if you look at most businesses, they have products, they have services, uh, and they have great people. And I, I want to tell you a little fable that was told to me many years ago that sticks in my mind and reminds me of your question. Um, a beggar comes through town um, and he sets up his little box in front of a busy store and he sits on the box and he has his hand out and a little sign that says, please help me, I'm starving. And people walk by and occasionally someone drops a penny into his little, his little cup until one day a wise man comes by and stops in front of the beggar and he looks directly into his eyes and the beggar looks up at him and says, can you spare a penny for someone in need? And the wise man turns to him and said, how about instead I show you the gold that is right under your butt? Would that be better than the penny? And the man said, well, what do you mean the gold is? Because the, what if I told you that the gold is so close to you right now that you absolutely wouldn't believe it? Would you rather have the penny or would you rather tell me, show, show you the gold? And the guy said, you know, I, I don't know. I... I guess I need the penny, but show me the gold. Okay, show me what the gold is. And so the man says, stand up. And so the beggar stands up and the, the wise man kicks the box that, he's, um, that he was sitting on. And the box break op breaks open and inside of that is a bundle of shekels, which is ancient money. And he says, how did you know that was there? He says, because you know something? I saw that as I approached you, but you didn't. So that was your hidden asset. You've been sitting on a fortune all this time and you didn't even realize it. And when you asked me the question, it made me think about that because, you know, so many businesses are sitting on a fortune and they don't even realize it. And that fortune is their client base. You see, everybody thinks of their client base in a singular dimension, they think of their client base as people who buy stuff from them or pay them money. Whereas my way of thinking about a client base is how can we mobilize them? How can we inspire a section, a portion, a tiny component of that client base into action and make them better people and take them to the next stage of their lives and be rewarded as a result? So when I say people and my business clients are basically sitting on a hidden asset, it's their client base. All we have to do is go to the top three to 5% of that client base and show them something exciting and they'll be open to that opportunity. So the way I think about it is that, and this goes back to the basic understanding of the early adapter syndrome. So in the early adapter syndrome, two to 5% of any group of people are going to be early adapters. They're going to be the ones on the bleeding edge of technology. They're going to be the ones to try the new drugs or the new technology. They're going to be the ones to spend the most on something new instead of wait for it to be out for two or three years and get it on sale. 
Those early adapters are the first movers in this world. And every group of people has two to 5% of them as those movers and shakers, the early adapters. So your base of clients does too. And so when we offer the chance to become certified and to become an expert and to take that expertise and change your world and, and go out there and create a profession around that, Two to five percent of your client base will stand up immediately and say, "Yes, I want to do that," and they'll pay anywhere from five to fifteen thousand dollars for that privilege. So, imagine if we had prepared the business model in it in advance. Imagine if we created a bulletproof training system that taught them everything about how to accomplish the same transformations that you can as a, as a company and allowed them to do it and gave them the tools to do it. And imagine if 20 of those people stepped forward, filling out an application to apply for the privilege of becoming a certified consultant with anywhere from five to $15,000 in their hands, you'd probably be interested in saying yes to those people. And that's what I mean by immediately generating hundreds of thousands of dollars simply by mobilizing the hidden asset, the clients who want more from you, they might, not even not, they might not even know they want more from you until you offer it. But that's what's possible. And that's what I mean by locating, finding that hidden asset. And that's what I love to show people. I like that. Very interesting and actually astounding when you look at the amount of revenue that can be made without really, I don't mean to make it sound that way, but without really doing very much more. Of course, it's hard work to train and put it together, but you're not releasing a new product necessarily. That's right. That's very, exactly right. Very smart. Mitch, what's the biggest mistake companies make when they try to set up a coaching system or a coaching team? Well, so we'll transition for a minute. You see, a lot of people uh, want to you know, have the idea of maybe uh, offering coaching services or creating a coaching team or, or even starting a certification program. And unfortunately, one of the first things they do is they say, okay, well, I mean, maybe what we'll do is we'll sell some, some certificates, you know, we'll sell certification. So what they do is they create, you know, they usually take their product and, you know, uh, offer it as part of a certification program. And then they add a little bit more to it. And then if somebody can pass through their, their little program, they sell them a certificate and say, okay, now you're certified. But then something happens. Something bad happens. It happens inside the team. It happens in such a way that you could never anticipate it. And when it happens, it happens slowly. It creeps in and you never know it. It's called the culture of the team. So what unfortunately happens if you put a group of people together is that many, many of those people are positive and excited about any new venture. But over time if they're not treated well, or if one person perceives a problem, they spread that problem. You know, the old saying that, you know, if, um, uh, if you create one bad customer, they'll tell hundreds of people. Unfortunately, if you create one good press customer, they don't tell that many. (laughs) It's the bad customer that usually is the one who's the most vocal. You know that saying how that goes? Yep. Absolutely. Well, the same thing happens inside of a culture. If one person becomes pissed off or, or, or has a problem, they tell the rest of everybody and they mobilize them in a negative way. So one of the problems with setting up a coaching team without an experienced person to do it is that it degrades over time. And unfortunately, that becomes a liability to the company and it can degrade to the point where it could destroy a company. And uh, I remember Tony Robbins had a problem with this many years ago with a third party organization that he had licensed with his materials, it got to the point where they had to shut it down because it had degraded so badly. So having been through this process and having created a very, very successful program, I started to try and encapsulate what it was that made my program successful. And what it came down to was really just one thing. It came down to culture. And so I started to do a study of What is it and how do you create culture in an organization? And what I found is that culture is really all about values. 
And it's about communicating the values that you believe are the most important to you to a group of people and get agreement that they're important, important to them too. So that's one of the things that I do with my clients is I create, I help them, and together we co-create the culture of their certified consultant program, their power tribe, even before we begin. And I have a very powerful tool that I use to do this with, and I share it with my clients, and together we build the framework for an incredible culture before we add a single person. And you know what happens, which is a fantastic result. What ends up happening is that people join the program and they have to understand, integrate the culture before they can even be allowed into the program. And as a result, they become happy. They're glad somebody has created these guidelines and knows in advance what to do when something happens that needs their attention. And so culture is all about making sure that everybody is heard, that everybody who has something to say can say it. And even those people who are afraid to still have a way to do it. And that's what we do with, my, with our clients is we create culture. And that's what I meant before by the biggest mistakes people make is they don't create this culture. They just let it sort of evolve on its own. And unfortunately, you know, it's sort of like when you look at a, a, a lot of land that has just evolved on its own. I mean, it's, it's certainly beautiful because it's the earth, but it's messy. You know, you have weeds growing here, you have grass growing there, you have shrubs and trees. It gets all over the place. But if you take a little time and every month you just work on neatening up the area, it can become a beautiful park. But it requires a little time and a little care and a plan. And that's what we do with our teams, our coaching teams. And that's how we create culture in our power tribes. Wow, that's some very clever stuff, Mitch. Very, very interesting. Now, how do you turn your clients into salespeople? Because to me, that sounds like, yes, it's a great idea, but it sounds like it takes some work and you really have to know what you're doing to really make them into salespeople because they're representing your product. True. But you know, the best part about this, I think if you try to make your clients into salespeople, it's, it's offensive. It, it could actually turn clients off. I mean, we don't really want to try and turn them into salespeople. We want them to evolve into wanting to sell our products. And the best way to do that is to make sure that they understand what's in it for them and, and help them really get an enormous value from doing so, from sharing, which is what this is all about. So one of the pieces of building a power tribe is creating the business model that makes a tribe successful. Because you know what? Anybody can create a certification program. Anybody can say, hey, take this test. And if you pass, after you pay me a bunch of money, I'll issue you a certificate. And you can hang it on your wall. Now you can go out and go get some clients and, hey, have a nice day. That's not what we do at all. See, what I do with my clients is we spend an intensive amount of time up front building the business model so we know exactly how our new Power Tribe members, our certified consultants, are going to make money. In fact, we literally build the tools for their success into our program. And I'm going to give you an example a little bit later in our discussion, Tony. I'm going to give, you, I'm going to give away one of the secrets about how to do that. But I want to explain a little bit more about the process itself. So what ends up starting to happen here is that as people realize that they are experts in what you do and that they could help people with your transformational program, with your software, with your process, and they start sharing that with people and they start getting paid to do it, people are attracted to them and people want your product. And after a while, after referring the company to, to their clients after a while, they finally get to the point where they say, hey, can I resell your product so that I can, you know, handle the sale and make a few bucks on the side as well? And, you know, of course, that program is built into our process. So we say, yes, we enable that up front. We say, if you want to, and if it's something that you care about doing, we will provide for you a way that you could sell our products, our software or our training programs, or our coaching programs, that you could sell them and you could get a percentage of everything you sell. 
And it's not the, the pivotal reason why you do what you do, but it's just a way to do something more that you might want to do that will also bring you closer to your client. And people love that. So that's how you begin the process of what I will call converting your salespeople into clients. And, and you know, the best part about this is that it's a very natural process. It's never forced. It's, it's something that happens simply by allowing people to be in the same place as you when you are making the opportunity available. So here's, here's the trick. Because once you get into a position where you have certified consultants, the idea is to involve them in everything you do. And I mean everything. Involve them in, you know, if you run trade shows, bring them to your trade show. Invite them to your trade show. If you run events, invite them to your events. If you travel from city to city to, to go to events, uh, uh, you know, set up a night, a special night at a restaurant and bring them all in for dinner. So no matter what city you're in, you're going to have certified consultants or certified coaches in that city and make it a policy that no matter what city you show up, you leave one night to take all your certified consultants to dinner and build that culture. Let them be with you, answer their questions, buy them a meal, tell them how much you appreciate them, and this will continuously build the culture and it will make them successful and will make them want to be with your company and with you more and more than, than they ever did before because they get to share in the experience of being successful along with you. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely, Mitch. I like that. Very smart, and it makes it very real, and it keeps that relationship very tight. Very good. Yeah, and it, it's a lot of fun, too. I mean, you're building relationships with people. It's, it doesn't become work. It's not work at all. All you're really doing, and here's an interesting thing. This is a side benefit. You know, before, before you know it, your network gets populated with a lot of smart people. And these smart people help improve your product too. They become your best beta testers. They become the community of people that, that are the first to really understand what you're doing. And they give you feedback. I mean, when I had my software company, these folks were avid and loyal beta testers of anything we released. And then what we started to do, and this is again, the evolution of a great program. Then what we started to do is we started to build tools just for our certified consultants so that they can do their jobs more easily. So we built back doors in so that they can access parts of our software that no other group can access, just our certified consultants that would allow them to do a higher level of diagnostics in the field and allow them to generate their work product much, much faster. So this is an ev uh, evolving process. You start with the relationship and it evolves. And before you know it, it, it turns into a tribe of people who become your family. And that's the most powerful group you can ever imagine. I like that. Very smart stuff there, Mitch. Very cool. You've got it well worked out. And I must say that is brilliant, truly. Well, well thank you. And, and when you say, you know, I have it worked out, Here's one of the benefits of having now done this several more times. Every time I've done it, I end up evolving my own tool set. So now when I bring a company in to get started with me, one of the first things I do is I don't just share wisdom or, or any of that. I actually build the flow charts. I build the mind maps for them. I've evolved the legal agreements. So when I bring a client in, I literally give them the legal templates that they need to sign up new certified consultants. On top of that, what I also do is I produce a pro forma, a complete profit and loss spreadsheet for every client just as they're starting so that they know in advance exactly what every penny is going to, how every penny is going to come into the company and how every expense is going to affect their profits and when they can expect growth and where that growth will happen. And then we start layering additional services in and we literally map them out month by month and dollar by dollar. And all of these are tools that have evolved over time with me doing this for more and more clients. So it's, it's, it's an enormous process that now is so well, it's a well-oiled machine that when I bring somebody in and I start working with them, the results are so easy to obtain that it's a, just a pleasure 
to build these relationships with my clients because I know it's coming and they're going to be thrilled. Very cool, Mitch. I like that. Anybody can do this. If it, it doesn't require you know, any magic here. You just need a few things. And would it be okay if I describe what it is that you need to do this? Absolutely, because that's sort of the next question I was going to ask was, you know, what's the ideal company for this? What's the demographics? And so on. So please. Okay. So, so, I mean, if you're just starting out in business, this is not a program for you. This is a, basically, it's considered a high-end program. And it comes after being in business for a while. Because in order to really make use of this, you really have had to have perfected what you do. You really need a base of clients. I don't know, five, six, seven hundred, a thousand clients that have already experienced the amazing transformation that you provide with your software, with your training program, with your information products, whatever it is that you do. You got to have a client base that's already happy and loving what you do. Then you have to be able to teach somebody how to repeat this process with another person. And once you know how to do that, then at that point, you're ready to have a conversation with someone like me who can show you the pieces of what it takes to take that client base, find that early adapter group, and then bring them into this power tribe and make them successful in their own business, whether it's a part-time business or evolving into a full-time business, it's something that they now can do based on what you provide. But it takes having had that success up front before you can start. And that's important, Tony. You can't just start from scratch with nothing and start building a power tribe. That goes without saying, okay. And because the company has built up hundreds, of, if not thousands of their own customers, they know what it takes to create their product they can now move into, it's sort of like an evolution, they can now move into the next echelon. Exactly, exactly. This is a second tier system for most people. I would say first tier is, you know, figuring out who you are, get your product right, sell a bunch of them, make people happy, you know, get a nice group of clients going, and boom, now it's time to bring in something like this. Okay. Is there anything else to the demographics? Obviously, this would be any type of companies that provide a product, a software? Are there companies that may not be a good type of company, even if they have a lot of clients? Well, sure. I mean, the whole thing is that what you're really doing is you're helping another person with your product. So, I mean, if you're a dentist, this isn't a good fit. You know, if, if, you, if you provide, um, you know, sort of a medical service of some sort, it's not a good fit. Uh, however, medical devices are a good fit. You know, we have a, a client that we're on the verge of signing now who has a medical device that they want to create, you know, a group of consultants out there to train other doctors on how to use it. And then, you know, in the process of chatting with this gentleman, he's also a doctor, I said to him, well, what would you think about letting your, your certified consultants or certified physicians resell your product as well? And his eyes lit up. He had never thought of that. So clearly, there, you know, it's, it's a widely applying process where you could basically take a group of people, make them expert at what you do, and then have them apply it to other people and get the same result as you. But they have to be able to do it independently. And that's the, that's the part of this that, that's important. They need to be able to cause that transformation and be it with software or with your processes in others before you can certify them in doing it. I got it. And again, I must say that is a brilliant concept, not just a concept. You've actually taken it through the school of hard knocks, evolved it, perfected it. And of course you're continuing to evolve it. I've got to say that is quite a great model, Mitch. Thanks, Tony. Sure. Around this time of the show, I like to talk about purpose. There's many reasons for it. And, you know, really like to know about you at this point, what drives you, what makes you keep on, what do you want to change in the world? So let's hear it from your heart, Mitch. Let's talk about your purpose. You know, it's sort of funny. I, I think I reflected on this question the last time you asked me uh, in our last interview. And um, I had told you then that part of the reason why I had written The Invisible Organization, which is all about companies being transformed 
into virtual organizations. And I said I had a hidden agenda. My hidden agenda was to free everybody who ever had to commute to work from that mind-numbing commute that everybody gets stuck with every day on the freeway, having to pay money for fuel and spend wasted hours getting to and from. You know, that was, that was my bigger goal. That was my purpose. And to some degree, it still is. But really, to go one level higher than that, you see, my purpose, and the way I see it in life, my purpose really is to help people enjoy their lives at a higher level by operating in a much more smooth fashion. And what I mean by that is that there's a lot of friction in this world. There's friction between people, friction between clients, friction between employees. And one of the things that I found is that if you can find a way to avoid the friction, it makes life much more enjoyable. So a lot of what I find that I'm enjoying with my own client interactions is showing them ways to do things easier, to showing them ways to make more money by mobilizing the existing assets they already have. And so I think my purpose really is just to help people enjoy their lives, to run better companies, to make more money, to get more satisfaction out of the relationships, both business and otherwise. And I love doing that. I love when I can see the effect of what I do in the real world. Wow. Very nice, Mitch. Very nicely said. Passionate. I feel it. Awesome. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure. Thank you. Well, all right. Well, you know, we are close to wrapping up. And is there anything else you'd like our audience to know about? And please, I want to make sure we make it very clear how they can find out more about Power Tribes. Well, sure. Well, first of all, I, I want to just say up front that if anybody decides that they want to go forward and build a Power Tribe of their own, to please remember that what you're doing is you take responsibility for this group of people because they are very, very special. And they're going to be very, very meaningful to you over the years. Treat them like family because they will be. They'll become your family in a way that you would have never believed. So I just want to make sure that people understand how important that element of this process is. It's a beautiful process. It brings people closer. It makes people money and it changes lives. And I want people to really be as serious, seriously involved in helping others transform their best clients in the same way that I know I can. So that would be the only thing I wanted to add to as a, as a parting comment. Well, all right. Well, thank you very, very much, Mitch. It's an honor to have you on the show once again. Very insightful. And I love Power Tribes. It's brilliant. And I'm going to make sure that on the show notes, people are going to know that the site is powertribes.net. And they can also go to mitchrusso.com to find out more about you and find out about your book and find out about your past accomplishments and so on and so forth. Sure. Yeah, just go to powertribes.net. Um, you could see a little bit about how the program works. You could watch a testimonial. You can interact with me. You could ask the qualifying questions. And yeah, it's a good place to start doing some research on whether something like this would work for you. I agree. Well, awesome. Well, thank you again. And I very truly appreciated having you on. And to everyone, please check out Power Tribes and listen to my other awesome interviews at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash radio. And please drop me a message. I'd love to hear from you. All right. Thanks again, everyone. And until next time, remember, you can make life better for yourself and everyone. Choose wisely. Choose wisely.